can start. So welcome everyone. Um, for those of you that just joined, yeah, my name is John Berry. I'm the chairman of Cognition Marketing. Uh, we're a digital marketing and sales agency based in Birmingham, London, and in Parma, uh, Mallorca. Um, it's great to have you here this morning. Um, I'm just gonna talk through one or two housekeeping issues that we need to, uh, just to, just to make sure that we get things organized and working as efficiently as possible. Um, and then I'll really look forward to introducing our guest speaker for this morning. In terms of some housekeeping issues, um, we're really keen to take as many questions as you've got within the hour allotted to us this morning. So please do ask as many questions. We suggest you use the Q&A pop-up in, in, uh, in the webinar. Um, if you could actually put your name to the question, that will really be helpful for me to make sure that I can um, identify who the questions come from. So if you could write it in the Q&A panel, that'd be terrific. Um, you can also put your hands up if you would like on the webinar software, um, but if we could ask you just to do that when we actually get to the Q&A session, which we'll take after the talk. Um, um, just if there's any general questions, if you're having problems at all with, with the webinar itself, please ask those questions and we'll deal with those immediately. We've got a, an administrator in the background and they'll get those sorted for you as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we've also got a good line of panelists um, and I'll introduce those later during our Q&A session. Um, so for the very beginning, I'm just keen to introduce to you our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Peter Hughes. Um, we're in uncharted territory. Um, many of you have been in business uh, for many years. I've been in business for 30 odd years, running uh, different companies. And it, it's just remarkable the period of time we're currently um, working in. And many of us have had to deal in the last sort of month with some incredible immediate challenges like um, shoring up the, the, the cash position of our businesses, uh, dealing with safeguarding employees and making sure that we're protecting our employees, um, helping to shore up our supply chains, getting production settled down as best we can, trying to assess what demand there might be left in the marketplace and the situation we're, we're faced with. Um, we're now turning our attention to trying to make our businesses resilient in these new circumstances, focusing in on cash, managing costs uh, really effectively, trying to work up new working practices so that we can operate as businesses. These things have been very, very challenging for everyone in the last um, three or four weeks. The position we're in now, and this is what this webinar is about this morning, is to think, what can we do in terms of re-evaluating re our businesses and getting ourselves in a sustainable position um, in the situation that we're in? turning our attention to how we can build that sustainable uh, business for the moment in time we're in. And it's, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce to you um, Dr. Peter Hughes. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Hughes is a psychologist from Warwick University. Um, he's been a, doc, a doctor of psychology and working with some incredible situations. He's got a history working with people with um, that have faced real crises in their lives from people with uh, real addictions, uh, people working in situations with, uh, with, a with homeless people, and also um, working from everyone from business people to actors and actresses. And it's, a, it's got an incredible um, range of experience in the whole field of psychology. But as well as being a psychologist, Peter is also a, a, a marketeer and has been with Tim Witchley, our managing director, was responsible for founding Cognition and um, works many, uh, many days a week with our clients and developing strategy. And so it's a real privilege to welcome Peter Hughes with us this morning. And Peter's gonna take us through this whole subject area of developing a digital lifeboat for, for the business and how we can reinvent our businesses in these remarkable times. Peter. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, uh, appreciate the the introduction and and welcome everybody to uh, to today's webinar. We're going to take you on a on a bit of a journey over the next thirty minutes or so. Then there'll be time at the end for everybody to ask whatever questions. 
that you, uh, you feel you want to ask or to cover any of the issues that we raised today. Um, so let's begin, um, as perhaps any psychologist would say, let's begin with some therapy. And, uh, and right now, I'm sure this is how you feel. Um, it is perhaps, and I say perhaps, um, unprecedented, the level of anxiety, fear, confusion, disruption that we all feel right now. And we're all turning literally hour by hour, day by day, uh, week by week, wondering what will happen next, wondering how we can adapt our businesses. And there's one question, one question above all others that we want to cover this morning um, that I'm sure is dominating your own thoughts and your own feelings and your own thoughts about your personal life as well as about your business. And how can my business get through this? How can I survive? And, uh, and what will my business be like when we come out the other side of this, uh, of this pandemic? Um, well, let's start with uh, a quote you may have heard before from Rahm Emanuel, who was the chief of staff under President Barack Obama. And he came out with a, a, a great statement. He says, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Think about that a moment. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. It would seem that we spend much of our lives, much of our commercial lives, avoiding crisis, trying to steer our business away from crisis. And yet what Rahm Emanuel seems to be saying is that crisis can actually be a good thing. It can give us time to rethink our business to do things that we would not normally do, to think about our business in ways we would not normally think about our business. But the challenge is, it's all well and good to say that. It's easy to say you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. But most of us right now simply want the crisis to end. So how can we make sense of what Rob Emanuel is saying? How can we utilize this crisis to make our businesses more resilient? to make our businesses better, stronger than they are today. How can we do that? Well, the first focus has got to be by thinking what we can do today and what we can do tomorrow. And as you'll see, as I go through this, there is a, a conflation of these two, two timelines. Um, but for now, just think, hold that thought in your head. What can we do today and what can we do tomorrow? Um, whether we're thinking about the present or the future, there's a process we have to go through. And it's really simple and straightforward. You do this consciously or unconsciously, deliberately or by accident, uh, every single day of your commercial lives. And that is, you identify the challenges you, you, your business faces. So, you know, cash, you know, right now you're looking at declining sales, you might be looking at prospects that seem to have vanished. Your staff might be confused, their morale might be low. You identify the challenges that you face. You then specify the resources you've got to overcome these challenges. Those resources are your people, they're the products and services that you sell, um, and above all, they're your clients. Because in these circumstances, they're also your resources. A way for you to engage, not just with the present crisis, but also with your future. By identifying the challenges, identifying the resources, you then create a plan of action. You act. You, you, know, you don't just think, you act. Uh, when you act, you will get feedback from the market. That feedback can come in two forms. It will come as qualitative feedback. In other words, people will tell you their opinions. And it can also come, particularly if you use automation platforms like HubSpot, and good lead tracking and good tracking of your social media, good tracking of your blogs, good tracking of your content. Um, that can also come in quantitative data, which obviously statistically is much more useful. So when you get that feedback, you adapt. So you adapt your, your plan of action. Plans are never more than provisional. As one famous uh, general said, plans never survive contact with the enemy. And now that is more true than ever before. We have to adapt depending on real world feedback. And then when that is done, we simply repeat the process. So let's start by looking at today. Now today, for most of us, is about survival and it's about stability. 
right now, many businesses uh, are in survival mode. And if they're not in survival mode, they are simply trying to stabilize an unforeseen and, as some would say wrongly, an unforeseeable situation. So what can you do today, right now, practical little things to help your business uh, find stability and to find a way through the uh, disruption that the uh, pandemic has caused? Well, the first thing any business must do at this point, and John alluded to this in his introduction, you must stress test your business. In particular, you must financially stress test it. I'm sure you've been doing that in the months and years previously, assuming that business will continue as usual, which of course it hasn't. As we'll see later, it doesn't. And in the future, it won't. But you must financially stress test your business is one thing to do immediately. Um, secondly, to generate help with cash and help generate cash and protect your cash flow, also protect your staff and protect your business, get support from the government and the local authority in any way that you, that you, you can. There's a, a broad range of measures available. I'm not gonna go through them now. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Many of them, many of you I'm sure have already acted on them, but take that support and take it to the maximum that you can. Um, the third point, always manage your employee well-being. Um, staff at the moment, um, and we can speak for staff in pretty much every business, are asking the question, one, am I going to get paid? Well, the government has helped with that. Secondly, is my job secure? Well, the government has helped with that too. So right now, it's really crucial that we both provide reassurance to employees, reassurance to our teams, and also guidance as to what the future might be like and how, to use uh, Rahm Emanuel's words, we can get value out of this crisis. We don't let this crisis go to waste. Um, another point that John made at the start, for those of you with complex supply chains, um, stabilize them. I mean, a lot of work that, that uh, we do with Cognition uh, has been with companies with complex supply chains. And I was speaking last year uh, in Milan at a conference specifically on supply chain management and specifically about what if scenarios. For those of you not familiar with supply chain management, a what if scenario, you imagine that your supply chain continues as normal. It's called sales and operations planning. So you plan for your supply chain where demand and supply are more or less in sync all the time. And then you allow for disruptions to that synchronicity. And, uh, um, and we went through all sorts of models um, during, in the course of this conference. And one thing that struck me is few, if any people, considered the fact that the supply chain could be severely disrupted by such a, such a thing as a global pandemic. It wasn't even on the agenda. Well, you can be sure as hell that it will be on the agenda in future. And stabilizing supply chains is absolutely crucial. Um, and we won't go into detail on strategies that can be used to, to do that, but it's a very important thing for those of you with complex global supply chains. Um, and crucially in, in our field really, is to remap marketing and sales activity and, and rethink really the metrics that you've been operating to. So, for instance, um, in the past, there might have been certain times you felt, certain times and certain days, that you felt it was better for you to send emails out to your prospects and your clients. Is that the same now? Test it. Check it. Do some A-B testing. There might have been the same issue with social posting. You might have had times when it was better to post uh, on uh, LinkedIn or to post on Twitter or to post on Facebook. Um, check that. Is that still appropriate? More important than anything, check the messaging. The messaging that you might have sent out in the past might not be the right messaging for you to send out now. Be sensitive to how you communicate with your customers and the messages that you send out. But also think about um, how some other organizations have dealt with it. Like for instance, the Guggenheim Art Museum in New York a few years ago virtualized its, 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 the entire museum. You can take a virtual tour of the Guggenheim now, of course, that really comes into its own because they had preempted the time. They worked with Google um, and, um, and they created uh, a, you can create a virtual tour of the Guggenheim Art Museum. And uh, many, of, many people we talk to, many uh, prospects we talk to um, want to virtualize their business, but in fact, they probably left it a little bit too late because they assumed business as usual would continue. Well, now is the time to rethink and remap your marketing and sales activity. Crucially, um, 
some clients, I can think of two of our clients, for instance, one is a property company. They've been able to, a property investment company, they've been able to use the current crisis really well because to attract investment because of the, the pound is obviously struggling. So to attract investment from Hong Kong um, and uh, uh, into, the, into the UK property market and their investment levels are booming. Another client we have that sells an educational product globally um, for a long while have wanted to take their business online to create a really viable online platform as opposed to making a lot of their educational programs classroom based. They have used this crisis to do that. And in a matter of weeks, literally two to three weeks, they put an online platform live, functional, operational, which they'd waited perhaps the previous six months um, before actually thinking, well, now we need to do it. So now is the time to rethink and remap marketing and sales. Manage your brand's reputation. How in the current crisis? What can you do today to manage your brand's reputation? Well, above all, be helpful, be supportive. Do not, under any circumstances, try and exploit the current crisis for commercial gain. Be helpful, be supportive, and, and give support to your clients, your prospects, who might be struggling right now. And think of ways which you can help them with information, maybe by running webinars, maybe by giving them advice, maybe by suggesting ways in which you can collaborate. Find ways in which you can be helpful and supportive to your clients. Also be sensitive to the imagery you use, for instance, be sensitive to the messaging you use. Make sure you're not saying anything that might be, uh, might be insensitive to uh, where your customers might be at. And, and crucially, for your own business, update your clients and prospects with how best they can contact you. If you make deliveries, what are the changes to delivery times? Are there changes to opening hours? When can you be contacted? What are your contact details? Make sure that this is updated. But the biggest thing, and this is really the, the point of, um, of today's webinar, the biggest challenge you face today by some considerable distance is tomorrow. What will your business be like tomorrow? How can you use this crisis to rethink and re-engineer your business? To not just think about survival and stability, but to think about prosperity and re-engineering your business. And that's what we'll spend the, the next 20 minutes or so um, going through. Now, some of you may be familiar with the term a black swan event. Um, for those of you who aren't, a black swan event is a rare extreme event, event with far reaching and pervasive effects. Um, the popular myth about black swan events is that they are beyond our control and they happen out of the blue. They come from nowhere. That's actually not what a black swan event is. A black swan event is an extreme, far-reaching event that we create. And we create the disruption and the far-reaching effects because we rule out improbable events in our business planning and in planning for our lives. We assume continuity. We assume that today, which is like yesterday, will be the same as tomorrow and the day after. We assume business as usual. So because we live in such a delusional psychological bubble, when something unusual happens, the effects are far greater than it would otherwise be. Take, for instance, the current pandemic. It was never a case of if a pandemic happens. It was always a case of when a pandemic happens. Mathematicians, statisticians, medical professionals, government agencies knew this. Some of them had been planning for it for some time. But for most people, we don't have this kind of disruption on our radar. And it's our sense that things will continue seamlessly from one trading cycle to the next that makes such disruptions so far reaching and so difficult to manage. The 2008 crash, was it predictable? Of course it was. The dot com, when the dot com bubble burst in the early 2000s, was that predictable? Of course it was. This will not be the last pandemic. There will be other pandemics. It's quite likely they will be more frequent. 
how can our businesses adapt? How can our economies adapt to cope with that level of disruption? The problem we have, of course, in managing black swan events is our brains, our decision making is very biased. There are probably over 300 biases, cognitive biases, that distort the way that we think. Um, let's just take a couple of them. The availability bias. We tend to make decisions based on information that is most cognitively available to us at any given time. So, for instance, in marketing terms, if you've sent out uh, a campaign, an email campaign, and you've had some good results, you will tend to generalize from those good results and think, well, that must be the way we should be doing our marketing. Well, no, that's just the most recent campaign you ran. You need to put that in the context of other campaigns and uh, both uh, present campaigns and past campaigns. And you need to measure the effectiveness against other potential variables by doing A-B testing, multivariant testing. Um, confirmation bias is another one. We tend to use information to confirm what we already believe. We don't use it to disconfirm what we believe. We use it to confirm what we believe. So in a very uh, famous case, E.J. Smith said uh, famously, I have never been in any accident of any sort, nor in any great peril, or words to that effect. Uh, he was, of course, the captain of the Titanic. So until the Black Swan event happens, we believe it's impossible. And we believe it's impossible because our brains, biased brains delude us into thinking that today will be like tomorrow and tomorrow will be like the day after and so on. But these, uh, these situations, there's an opportunity for us to do extraordinary things when there's a crisis. Look at this list of businesses here. Each one of these, these businesses started uh, during either just before, just after or in the middle of the Great Recession of 2008. The guy who put this together was Larry Kim, who himself founded WordStream in 2007. So out of adversity, extraordinary things can happen, but it takes a certain mindset for that to happen. You have to think in a certain way. You have to act in a certain way to get the best out of a crisis. So yes, you need to do the things I mentioned earlier to create stability and to make sure your business survives. But the real survival of your business depends on how you manage the future. And you can start managing the future right now. And the question you need to ask is this one, what will my business be when this is over? Well, one thing we know is that there's only one thing that, that the answer to that question depends on. What your business will be like will not depend on the coronavirus. It will not depend on the strength of the pound. It will not depend on markets. It will depend on you. That we have the power to actually control more than we think we do. We only lose control of our lives and our businesses by trying to control the wrong things. So when you want to re-enter your business, Here's uh, Cognition's three steps for doing it. And this is the approach, the way you approach re-engineering your business and the way you approach a crisis. And you never approach a crisis in the middle of one. Approach it before, prepare for the next crisis. Firstly, perception is everything. What I mean by that is really simple. Imagine, for instance, you see a house burning. Uh, one person sees a house burning and says, that's a tragedy. Another person sees it and says, well, actually, it's an opportunity because that house was a bit of an eyesore. Perhaps we can build something better. But in fact, it's just a house burning. It's neither of those things. We make of the world and we make of what happens to us by how we perceive it, not by what actually happens. And the key to this is to focus on what you can control. You cannot control the Great Recession of 2008. You cannot control this pandemic or the next one or the one after or the one after. But what you can control is how you respond to it. What steps do you take now to future proof your business? What steps can you take now to make sure that the next crisis that comes along is not one that has the negative effect on your business that the current crisis might be happening? And the key to that is to embrace chaos. And by chaos, I simply mean permanent, pervasive disruption. 
The disruption you are experiencing now is not something new. We are living in a time where disruption is permanent and pervasive, largely driven by technological innovation. And we'll come to one possible effect of that in the automotive industry in a moment. But you embrace that. Just because you've seen your business continue reasonably seamlessly month after month for however far back you choose to look, that's just an availability bias. Your business will face disruption on the scale it's facing now and perhaps greater in the future to come. That disruption is permanent and it's pervasive. So what stops us? Well, this is what stops us. We live our lives driven by habit. And habits, of course, uh, like the fear that feeds them, are exaggerated in a crisis where our emotional resources are limited and when we can get overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the things we have to do to stabilize our businesses and, uh, and to protect our livelihood and to protect our staff. So fear gets exaggerated, habit gets exaggerated and they feed each other like a feedback loop. Your habits, you get attached to them because they drive your behavior. The more you do something, both personally and commercially, the more ingrained that behavior becomes. And when that behavior is challenged, the more resistant you are to change. Until, of course, you have to change. And the key to change is not to look what confirms your beliefs, but what disconfirms them. Take a look at this airplane. The red dots on this plane were uh, where the plane was hit by anti-aircraft fire during the Second World War when it was flying over Germany. It was an aggregate of all the planes that returned back to base because the mathematicians, the scientists, the military personnel wanted to work out why, how, why the planes were being uh, shot down, where they were most vulnerable. So they were looking at where these planes were hit until one mathematician by the name of Abraham Bald said, we're looking at the wrong things. Ignore these red dots, ignore them because these planes returned home. These were the planes that came back. The ones that didn't come back are the ones we're interested in. So we need to focus on the areas that weren't hit because that's probably where the planes that didn't come home were struck. That simple shift in thinking, instead of trying to confirm where the plane, why the planes, uh, but to confirm an existing belief about how planes came back, the move was to disconfirm it. Always seek to disconfirm your beliefs. And that's going to be imp incredibly important because we need to adapt faster than we've ever had to adapt before because the change we are going through is fast and exponential. Look at this uh, logarithmic plot here. You will see this is the uh, um, processing power, if you want, of a thousand dollar laptop. And, um, and by uh, 2025, 2030, it could have the, 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 the functionality of a human brain in terms of its capacity to process data. But by 2060, it could have the functionality of all human brains. Look how fast that change happens. It goes very slow, then suddenly it takes off. The future is one that's gonna be dominated by artificial neural networks, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, we're not prepared for that. Our businesses simply do not realize that not only are we not prepared for it, but that it is already happening. We need to embrace that permanent pervasive change, embrace chaos and plan for tomorrow now. Not, to, not the day after, not, not next month, not next year, now. Because this disruption is coming. Let me give you the, an example of the automotive industry. Three technologies, a convergence of three technologies um, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and on-demand transportation will mean that within a few short years from now, you will no longer be buying a car. And the internal combustion engine will be consigned to history. Think about it. An electric vehicle has fewer than 20 parts, 20 components. The internal combustion engine has more than 2,000. Autonomous vehicles are simply operating systems on wheels, and the market will be dominated by Android and iOS. And when electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles and on-demand transportation, our ability to demand transport when we need it comes online, we will no longer be buying cars. And TAS or transport as a service by 2030 will be 10 times cheaper, 10 times cheaper than owning your own car. 
and it will take 95% of the market. So if you're an automotive manufacturer right now and you are uh, a tier one supplier, a tier two supplier into the automotive industry, your industry is going to be very different a few short years from now. So how do you cope with this? Well, for those of you that have uh, watched uh, MasterChef, MasterChef, of course, you focus on the ingredients you're given. You don't wait for the perfect moment to change. You don't wait for the perfect moment, the perfect ingredients to make the perfect dish. You're given some ingredients, you're told, get on with it. That is the situation we're in now. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't assume business as usual. Act and act now. Do the things you need to do to ensure survival and prosperity, to do, sorry, to ensure survival and stability. But above all, do today what guarantees prosperity and by re-engineering and rethinking your business, thinking about new markets, thinking about new ways of engaging with your clients, thinking about how you can reconfigure your products and services, thinking about how you can virtualize your business. Do it and do it now. Because once you let go of fear and habit, you create another loop. We call it the curiosity and the creativity loop. This is where you want to be. In the middle of a crisis, do the three things we said. Recognize perception is everything. Focus on what you can control and embrace chaos. Accept permanent pervasive disruption as the norm. Difficult though that may be. When you do that, you have a, an intense focus on, an, on the present and a huge degree of adaptability. Be curious about what your business might be like. Be curious about how you can turn this crisis to your advantage. That will then unleash your creativity, feedback to your curiosity, and on and on. So you have a choice. Fear and habit on the one hand, curiosity and creativity on the other. They are both feedback loops. The one you need to rethink and re-engineer your business right now is curiosity and creativity. So in summary, we live in survival and stability. That's where we are now. But where we, what we need to do now is to re-engineer our business and to generate future prosperity. Don't wait until the next crisis. Don't wait until the next crisis to virtualize your business. Do you utilize the digital tools and the intellectual thinking you need to do right now to imagine what your business can be and make it possible. Remember, break your habits, break them. Think about the habits you've got, break them. Think about the way you do business. How can it be improved? How can you change it? You've certainly got time now to sit down and think about this. Stephen Covey famously in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talked about the most important box we need to be in is the important and not urgent one, but it's the one we spend least time in. Well, until it becomes, like it is now, important and urgent. Do what's important and not urgent. Prepare for the next crisis now. Re-engineer, rethink your business now. Use the digital tools at your disposal now. Virtualize your business now. And remember, perception is everything. Focus on what you can control and act now. Act now. Perhaps a, a more um, poetic way of, of putting it in the road not taken, a, a famous poem by the poet Robert Frost. He said, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Take the road less traveled. Make the decisions now that can not only protect your business in the future, but that can enhance it. At Cognition, we have three core values, speed, simplicity, and courage. Speed, because we know how fast we have to act, how fast our clients have to act to cope with a state of permanent pervasive disruption. We know the simpler we make our messaging, the simpler we make our communications, the more likely it is those communications are going to be acted on. And perhaps most important of all, have the courage to take the road less traveled. Have the courage to challenge, to disconfirm your own beliefs, your own assumptions, your own behaviors, break the habits. Which is why we say our job really isn't just marketing, sales, technology, or even psychology. Our role is to change the way organizations think, change the way they feel, change the way they act. That comes first. All the tactics, all the marketing automation, 
all the websites we build, all the campaigns we run, all the insight we bring into search, all the social networks we manage, that follows. The key is to th change the way you think, feel, and act. So thank you for, um, for uh, um, your time. And uh, I shall now hand over again to John, who will introduce the, uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'd just quickly like to introduce you to the panelists that we've got for the Q&A session. Uh, we've got four panelists all together up on your screen. Uh, we've got Tim Witchley, who's the Managing Director and co-founder with Peter of Cognition. Uh, we've got Daniel, uh, otherwise known as Dan. Dan Edwards, who's our Client Services Director. Uh, Sophie, Sophie Eastope, who is one of our Account Directors. And Chris Barnes, who heads up Search. Um, so we've got some questions. Um, thank you for your questions that come in. We'll deal with the first one. Um, actually, Peter, we'll deal with the first question with you, if that's okay. Um, one of the panelists, oh sorry, one of the attendees asked a question, both myself and more importantly, my employee is extremely anxious right now. Um, how do I deal with this? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, uh, the first thing is to realize that, that this will pass. This crisis will pass. I, it, with every person I've ever dealt with, in any personal or professional crisis, the first thing I have to get them to see, it's a temporary stay. It will pass. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I think one psychologist did a study once which suggested we spend up to seven years of our lives worrying about things that never happen. Never happen. And uh, so the first thing to say to anybody who's anxious at the moment is to think about it rationally and focus on what you can control. There's a phrase in psychology we call it catastrophizing, and it goes something like this, you know, um, something bad happens, then we think, oh my God, then, uh, then I might lose my job, and then if I lose my job, I'll be able to pay my mortgage, and I can't pay my mortgage, I'll lose my house, I'll lose my house, and the world will end. So we go all the way down that sequence, and in fact, focus on what you can control. Tell them, this crisis will pass. Manage it calmly, coolly, rationally. Ask them, if you were to get through this, imagine you've got through this to the other side. What might have, what would have had to happen for that to take place? What actions can I take now to help you on that journey? Reassure them that, that the business will come out of this stronger. Ask them for their ideas. How can they help reconfigure, rethink the business right now? Get them engaged in the present problem. Don't let them catastrophize about the future. Inevitable though perhaps that is in the current mindset, but in any crisis, and I, I speak here from experience of facing very difficult crises. Or the key thing I've learned is stay focused on the present. Don't extend yourself into the far future. If you're negotiating in a difficult situation, for example, a life-threatening situation for somebody, don't imagine, don't tell, oh my God, this is going to be terrible, somebody's going to die. Just focus on what the person is saying, what they're doing, what they're feeling right now. Stay present focused. And, uh, and obviously, and... and uh, and, and keep your employees, keep, keep your staff, keep the person, keep your people engaged at all times. For instance, a cognition, Tim, our managing director, runs 9.15 every morning. We have a, we have a get together, we have a, a team meeting, 9.15, everybody joins in. They can ask any questions. Um, Tim's door, as is mine, is always open for people if they want to talk about any anxieties they've got or any fears they've got, and that's the way to manage it through. But keep people focused on the present, don't let them catastrophize. Thank you, Peter. Um, and next question we've got is somebody that's got a, obviously a face-to-face -face sales team um, that are normally working um, through sales visits with clients. Um, and their question is, how do I adapt my sales process, that face-to-face -face sales process to a, more of an online model? Um, I'm going to ask Sophie Easthope um, to take this question. Sophie, are you there? I am. Thank you, John. So I think looking at this is probably two elements to it. So it's looking at your, both your communications, <coughs> excuse me, and also your technology. So obviously moving to online, you still need to have a look at what are your customer touch points. So what we're seeing with some businesses now is that sales cycle is really speeding up, but we still need to make sure that we're having that relevant communication with our customers 
and we're giving them the information that they need to buy. So firstly, I'd say have a look at what communications have you been doing in the past and how can you move that to a mixture of automated email communications? Can you set up online meetings with your customers? So just because we're now typically working from home or remotely, we still need to have that face-to-face -face communication with our customers. So looking at ways that you can make sure that you're still getting that in and you're really helping your customers to make that buying decision. So not everyone will be ready to buy straight away and we still need that content to ensure that they're, they're buying into the right person and into the right business. And then the second element of it is your technology as well. So again, we're seeing with a lot of customers, they're used to having um, pieces of paper, everything is signed face to face. But what you can look at doing now is how do you speed up that process? How do you change that to something to make it really easy so that your customers can complete that that buying and, and that purchase. So to give you an example there, we use something at Cognition called PandaDocs and quite a few of our clients also use this. And it's essentially a, um, an e-doc so that you can send that over to your customer. They can sign that all online. It's all automated so you get notifications when that's been done. And it's just looking at ways where you can really tidy everything up so your customer knows what they should be doing and when and you've got all of that um you've got all of that history recorded on your side as well so just to summarize on that really it's looking at the technology that's out there to help you do it but also remembering that communication is still key so just because it's online you still need to build that relationship with your your customers and you need to look at those touch points and build them in Great, thank you, Sophie. That's terrific. Um, just before we move on to um, some more questions, we've got some more questions lining up. Um, we'd invite you to carry on asking any questions. Just use the Q and A panel. Um, also, want to thank everyone for attending. I think we've got over a hundred attendees today, so really appreciate people taking time out to attend. Um, going on to the next question, which I'm going to ask Dan. Um, Digital marketing at this time, uh, how do we get planning and get going on it from the point of view of we've not been that digital in the past, we really want to move forward digitally? Dan. Thank you, John. I think um, if I'm looking at planning digital marketing at this time, I would be thinking about this in three broad phases. So thinking about the a medium uh, the immediate short term so right now so we're in unprecedented circumstances we're in lockdown we're in shock and we need to adapt to these circumstances and then the medium term so we expect to see some return to normality but things are in fact far from normal um, we expect at some point the lockdown will end um, but it is likely to return as we try to flatten the curve and the way that consumers and businesses react and how we market to those um, need to be tailored to those circumstances. And then the third phase is longer term. So seeing society and business returning to normal um, in the way that they, uh, consumers and businesses are researching and buying their products and services and obviously how we reach them. And I think that we can see that these phases are going to happen, but when they happen, we just don't know. And what we're seeing is things are changing quite quickly day to day. So we need to plan for those scenarios and we almost need to have a movable line for those different phases that we can then implement different strategies and tactics as we move through those times. So in terms of immediate short term, we need to answer uh, our customers and prospect challenges and the, um, the problems that they face. And I think that quite quickly, people will be starting to um, search out some semblance of normality and I think that's where, as Sophie just mentioned, we can look at how we can adapt the marketing we're doing to use more online resources. So this very webinar, for example, um, virtual workshops, um, virtual exercises. So uh, last week, um, for example, I, I ended up running a, a client workshop with one of our clients that traditionally would always be done face to face. 
Um, but it was necessary to, to happen. Uh, there was a desire from both the client and ourselves to progress the project. So we did the thing virtually. You know, we used an online tool to do so. Uh, we used video conferencing. So we managed to deliver almost business as usual, but by, by adapting to the circumstances. And I think the other thing about the immediate short term is that we need to be crucially thinking about not just today and tomorrow, but what new measures do we need to put in place? How do we change the way we engage and serve our customers? And therefore, what preparation do we need to do at the moment? And actually, there is an opportunity there. Um, we're, 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 somewhat, um, we're somewhat limited in terms of where we can go and what we can do. So perhaps we have more time and there's a chance to get to all those important um, but maybe not urgent tasks that, that we should now be addressing. Thinking beyond the immediate um, to the medium term, so we'll be able to return to some of the traditional tactics we've used, um, but recognising we'll still need to adapt. So more online content, for example, more um, digital resources, and then preparing and implementing the longer term changes we need to protect our future prosperity. So there could well be things that we're thinking about right now that we'd like to put in place, but we're physically restricted because we can't get back into our businesses. Um, we can't maybe get hold of assets and resources we need to, but very shortly we will, we will be able to. And it's important that we, we take advantage of that time to, to plan for the ongoing. And then the final point is obviously longer term. So that's when we expect to see a closer return to business as normal. Um, and we can start to return to some of the, the ordinary tactics that we use, but we should very much take advantage of what we've learned and how we've needed to develop during this difficult period. Great, Dan, thank you very much. Um, following on from that, um, this whole era of digital, how quickly can I transform my business to digital? Uh, Peter, could you perhaps give us some insight? If people want to transform and get on with it now. How can they get on with it now? But very quickly, I mean, extremely quickly. Um, to give you, I gave an example of uh, one of our clients who runs a global educational business who had taken an entire educational program online. I think it's taken, well, us and them about three to four weeks to do it. Um, I can give you another example of uh, another, funny enough, an educational business that we, we deal with, again, with a global footprint. And they were considering doing this in, uh, in mid-November. And I said, look, you really need to, to virtualize your training, to virtualize your offering. Because what if you weren't able to travel to all these different countries? Because they were literally traveling all over the world delivering these programs. And I said, no, 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 okay, we'll wait, let's defer it. And of course, now those programs have ground to a halt. Had they have done that, we could have virtualized that business literally in a matter of weeks. And, uh, and it's worth saying something here, um, that we don't, when we virtualize a business, when we take a, um, a, a tra transforming and digitizing a business, if you want, uh, we don't wait to do it all at once. We do it in stages. So we break a program into what is essential for us to do and what's desirable for us to do. The essential stuff we, we do quickly and we do fast and we prioritize that. Uh, we don't wait. Remember I mentioned in the, in the talk, don't wait for perfection. Don't wait for the ideal scenario. Don't wait for all the ducks to be in a row. Do what you can, get what's essential done and then build on it. And uh, another way of putting that is when you're taking your business online, when you're digitizing your business, uh, keep it as simple as you possibly can and let the complexity emerge over time. So yeah, it can be done really quickly. So if, if a client came to, to, to me today and said, uh, obviously without a specific program, it's difficult, but how quickly can I take some core assets and uh, sales processes and, and put it all online? I would certainly say within uh, probably anything from two to three to, to seven to eight weeks in, in that bracket. It can be done very, very quickly indeed. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, Search is a big area. Um, obviously, lots of people want to get online. How do you get yourself out there and get your biz business known now from a search point of view, um, informing your customers or potential customers what you've got to offer? Uh, Chris, um, who heads up our search, could you answer that perhaps? Um, I, think, yeah. I think some of the panelists are being a bit shy with their video, so feel free to put your video on, Chris. <laughs> So um, I think the main, the main point here, which is, has been touched on a couple of times, but it's just removing the barriers um, with that customer journey as much as possible. And um, I think a, a good way of doing this is doing a quick audit of all the information that's on your platforms, um, could be directory listings, your Google My Business channel in particular, any social media channels, um, putting some emails out and updating your website banner. 
but just telling customers about your current situation. So you'll have noticed a lot of the times now when you search for a business on Google my, on Google, and you'll see the pop-up in the right-hand corner, it will often, it can be out of date information. It might say the business is still open, but you might now have different business hours. You might have a different contact number with working remotely. Um, you, you might also be offering a new service. So I think this is the perfect time to say, put a Google post out there and tell people what you're currently doing. It could be that your delivery time is much shorter than other people. So that can be quite a key thing for people who want to get hold of something now. But I think it's making sure that you've got all of that information up to date in all of the right places and just letting them know about how, the, how best to get in contact with you. For instance, we're, um, we're running business as usual because we're quite used to remote working. Uh, but there might be a new way that you want to to kind of engage with people. And I think a key thing here is to, with any of your adverts or with your social posts, is to avoid direct mention of COVID in your copy because channels are cracking down a lot on the spread of misinformation because some people might be trying to capitalise on it or spreading information that's not necessarily correct. Um, so when the platform is checking your content, it might automatically disapprove it if you mention the word COVID specifically. So I think talking about it more generally, um, say during this crisis or during this difficult time, will help you to stop facing those issues. But as Peter mentioned before, I think being respective and sensitive to your customers' needs is really important at the moment. You might have emails that are scheduled to go out or you've set, scheduled your social media posts and you've got adverts running that might be, it might even include imagery such as people shaking hands or people in a meeting room that are quite close together. And with all the information out there about how we should avoid, be more, do more social distancing, those types of imagery and the messaging around it is no longer relevant. So I think it's definitely worth having a quick audit of all your channels. Um, and as Peter said as well, is making sure it's not the time for a hard sale. So just say that you're open for business and you're willing to help people. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Um, I think we've got time just for one final question. Um, Victoria, we've got a question from you. Please, can you give an example of how businesses can effectively prepare uh, for these unexpected situations? Um, I think we'll finish that one with, with uh, Peter. Can you help answer that one, Peter? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a brilliant question because running a business is essentially about managing risk. That's what all entrepreneurs, all, all large businesses and small businesses do. We manage risk. And what we have to do, firstly, is to assess the risk that we face. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in, in risk management, there's a wonderful book by uh, Michael Lewis called The Fifth Risk, when he says uh, the five risks face in the United States. And he said, well, we've got Iran, North Korea, we've got attack on the national grid, they were three. Uh, the environment, of course, was one. But the fifth risk was the one he focused on. And the fifth risk is when we provide short-term solutions, short-term thinking to long-term problems. And, and he said that is the biggest risk that he said the United States faces right now. But it's the, it's the biggest risk that any business faces. So if you're saying, how do we prepare for these risks? It's really simple. Risk assess your business. Look at what the worst thing that can happen is. Let me give you an example. Imagine, for instance, you're a, a bricks and mortar business. Right? You rely on football, somebody coming into a physical place to buy what you do. What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst scenario you face? Well, for whatever reason, if, if they, people can't access those bricks and mortar spaces, which is exactly what's happening right now. So if you assess the risks that your business faces, and you have one like that, then you should immediately, this would be an important and not urgent box, of course, when, when trading is normal, but you should think that's a risk I need to protect my business against, because that is a business critical risk. And you should always map out your business critical risks and deal with them now. Deal with them when times are good. Don't deal with them when times are bad. And, and we're not good at that. And, I, and for one very simple reason, um, I can give you the example out of earthquake insurance. When an earthquake happens, more people buy earthquake insurance to cover themselves against future earthquakes. And then they let it lapse. But they don't need to buy that insurance straight after an earthquake. They need to buy it some years later when there hasn't been an earthquake for some time or when one might be due. But that's not the way we think. So my answer is risk assess your business, 
look at the catastrophic risks that your business could face, deal with them now. And out of that risk assessment process, you will also find creative ways to re-engineer your business, I can guarantee it. It's just a way of thinking and it future-proofs your business. Great, thank you, Peter. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists, Dan, Sophie, uh, Tim, sorry, we didn't have a question for you this time, Tim, and also Chris, thank you very much. Um, just want to quickly move on to telling you a little bit about what's happening next week. Um, we've got a, if we could just move on slide um, for the host, please. Um, yeah, next week we've got um, a fascinating speaker. A lot about this situation is about being visible with leadership. Um, and for businesses that are going to get through this and get through this effectively, and also to reinvent themselves, as Peter was talking, was visible leadership is absolutely critical. And, and next week, we've got Alan Chambers, um, who wasn't just the, only the first person to sort of successfully um, manage a British unsupported expedition from Canada to the North Pole, but also, for a rugby fan like me, was um, invited by Sir Clive Woodward uh, to go in and um, provide motivational talks on leadership and um, to the rugby team that won the World Cup in 2003, Johnny Wilkinson and all that. So um, I think it'll be a fascinating session. We'd love you to join us. So please register. And um, I think it'll be a really worthwhile seminar to join. Um, finally, I'd like to invite you to join us for a virtual coffee. Um, you can register by um, responding to Lindsay, who sent out the invitations. You can also uh, register through um, the, the Cognition website or just by um, following the link on the screen and we'd be delighted to any member of staff from Cognition to have a virtual coffee with you to talk through um, any of the issues that we've raised today and um, to give you any support we can. This isn't a heavy sell for Cognition, this is just out there wanting to give you support in this difficult time as we ourselves are trying to get support to keep our business going. So we want to thank you for joining us this morning. Um, thank you to Peter for a really insightful talk. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you most of all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your schedules and joining us. Uh, please keep safe and we look forward to um, hopefully you joining us next week. Thank you very much. Bye bye.